So from a really young age, my dad always used to preach to me this idea about thinking using your gut. Because he said that most of the time, all you really needed to make a decision was your gut instinct. But for the next six minutes, what I'm going to actually ask you guys to do is really think and make some judgments. Because when we really break down the issues that revolve around each of the previous speakers' topics, we see that it really revolves around one thing, and that's decision making. And we, as we all know, the way that we actually make decisions is with this little thing that we have in our heads called a brain. So on average, an adult makes about 35,000 decisions per day. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So now while you're sitting here listening to me speak, you probably also have about 50 other things going on in your head right now. Whether it's a project that you have to do for school, or whether you have to remember to pick up groceries on your way home. And ultimately, all of these things are going on in the back of your head, or what scientists call the subconscious. Sigmund Freud, get the next slide. Uh, Sigmund Freud, an Austrian neurologist, actually defined the percentages of your mind that are made up by the subconscious, conscious, and unconscious portions of your mind. He said that your subconscious is actually composed of about only 10% of your mind, or about 50 to 60% of your mind, while your conscious only composes about 10%, and while your unconscious composes about 30 to 40%. Now, this is a huge deal, because what this means is that when we're actually actively thinking about the next thing we're going to do, or the next action we're going to perform, we're only using about 10% of the brilliant organ that we have in our head. Now that you guys have an idea of what the brain does when you're actively thinking, let's go into what the brain does when you're not actively thinking. So in order to dive into the vast field that scientists know as our subconsciousness, scientists use a type of imaging technique known as an fMRI, or a functional magnetic resonance imaging, to die, scan and diagnose problems with our brains. Now, in an experiment done by the Journal of Neuroscience, the scientists used an fMRI scan to see which parts of the brain were being active when a participant was shown a specific picture. So typically what happens is that the brain will remain in low-level activity for the most part until the subject is shown that picture. And at that time, different neurons in the brain will start firing off. And this moment is known as the eureka moment. But what actually in the brain drives this eureka moment? Well, there are many specialized cells in regions of the brain that are specific for the eureka moment. But the two that we're going to focus on here today are the striatum and body combo neurons. Now, I don't want to bore you guys with too many boring facts about the brain or stuff like that. So for this next part, I'm going to bring out a volunteer, Rishi, who's going to help me out with something in detail. All right, Rishi, so I have two boxes here for you. Um, in one box is something really good, and in the other is something really bad. Okay, so they also, each of the boxes, have an image on them. So why don't you go ahead and pick one of the boxes. Okay. All right, so when Rishi made his decision to pick this box, he had no idea what was going to be inside it. But if I pour out what's in this box, it's a bunch of candy, so I guess he picked the right one. But if I choose the other box, you can see that there's exactly the same thing in it. So ultimately, when Rishi was making his decision, he was trying to make a correlation between the image that was on the box and what was going to be inside it. And the two images, of course, are the Grim Reaper and the Angel, both of which clearly symbolize good and bad. But no matter how many times Rishi evaluated this decision in his head, there was ultimately some impulse in his prefrontal cortex, or the part of the brain that's associated with complex decision making, that told him to go with the box with the Angel on it. All right, so if we can get a quick round of applause for Rishi. All right, so now let's get back to those two foreign sounding words I told you about before, the striatum and body combo neurons. So first, let's start with body combo neurons, also known as jacket neurons. And these are the type of neurons that are thought to facilitate complex thinking and are found in the cingulate cortex, the region of the brain just above the corpus callosum, a structure that connects your left and right brain hemisphere. Now, when we talk about the striatum, on the other hand, it's actually the cluster of these neurons at the base of your forebrain. That is, responding to both goal-directed decision-making strategies and stimulus-response decision-making strategies. Goal-directed decision-making strategies is the more long-term style of decision-making that we utilize so that we can accomplish a certain task while being given an incentive to do so. And this type of incentive-based approach is actually used a lot by scientists and experiments. So like the experiment that Rishi just performed for us, or maybe when you're actually creating a maze for a mouse, where at the end, the mouse is promised a small piece of cheese. Now, stimulus response decision making, on the other hand, is actually a type of decision making that we use when we're reacting to a certain stimuli. So for example, if I put my hand on a hot stove, 
my knee reaction is going to be to lift my hand up because my brain and my body both realize that my hand is currently getting toasted and they don't exactly like when that's happening to me. So why does all of this actually matter? So five minutes ago, I started talking to you about how your brain makes judgments and decisions. And yet most of the time, these are the judgments that you make what, uh, as far as what you can see. But now let's focus on the topic of this event. And that's focusing on the judgments that you can't see, more than what you can see. And in an increasingly changing world, we often find ourselves struggling to know when we've gone too far, or maybe when we need to go further. And when we're <laughs> meeting someone that we don't fully understand, knowing how your brain can make decisions in the first place might help you limit yourself or even extend a hand to these people. Because at the end of the day, we're all ultimately plagued by tracking neurons. And we're all using the same wording in our heads to make decisions. And I think that, contrast to what my dad said about thinking with your gut, we should actually use the thing that we use to make decisions, our brain, a little bit more every once in a while. Thank you.